Hello, hello. Aloha, everyone. Good to Where see everyone. Yeah. Wow. It's always so amazing to me because here we all are. <laughs> Aloha. Today I'm in Eastern Daylight Time, so for one more day, so uh, I get to experience what it's like to come to the Sunday sitting at this different <laughs> hour. <laughs> Have sympathy for you all. We make stay up late. Okay, let's get started. Oh. So coming into your seated posture. Letting your eyes come to close. Noticing what naturally arises to the forefront of your awareness. And textures and tones, sensations. of all of the sense doors. Streams sometimes experienced as so woven together. Folding in on one another. I'm not trying to manipulate or control, adjust or change. Just to the best of our ability, noticing what is arising, existing, passing. each of the sense doors, including the mind. Sometimes can seem in relationship to the others, but it's also its own stream. Getting a sense of what it takes to keep up with this stream of experience, sense of energy and alertness, the brightness of mind. and a lightness, a fluidity, a suppleness of mind. Given how fast everything is moving, you can see that when the attention is too heavy or tense, it can lead to a kind of 
dullness or slowness. So we just try to watch. Watch the mind, watch the body, sounds, smells, tastes. visual impression. Trusting that the practice really doesn't need to be any more complicated than this. But even these six streams can get so entangled, happening so quickly, can feel quite complicated. So we do have the method of drawing the attention more closely to one aspect of what's happening. Perhaps just opening to the realm of the body seated. This still quite wide range of sensation. as our primary field of awareness. Letting the experiences of the body direct the attention of the mind. Receiving, investigating, experiencing, letting them go. Maybe narrowing the field of attention to the area of the hands. If that smaller field feels more contained, more manageable, more possible for the attention to keep up with. or the area around the abdomen. You may notice the sensations of rising and falling. As the breath naturally moves. Long or short deep or shallow, relaxed or tight, constricted, 
however the breath is. Letting the attention settle into the synchronized connection. Gentle, clear. Supple, committed, or perhaps something outside of the body, like the stream of sound that we still receive at the ear door. changing stream of vibration, texture, tone. Of course, the mind will wander away from this primary object. We simply notice it, receive that experience in the same way. tender curiosity, genuine interest. The light mental note, thinking, wanting, planning, aversion, before coming back to the sound or the direct physical experiences of the breath, the hands, or the entire field of body experience.
Hey, Steve, I'm just making sure. Did you hear the bell? Michelle, we can't hear you. You're muted there. It wasn't that loud on my my okay. mind, so yeah. Great. It's all yours, Steve. Can you hear me? Okay, everyone. Yeah. Good. I was remembering this morning and went for a swim and a little free diving. And I was I was struck by how but I've been doing that, that for over six decades. I've been in this ocean, in the Hawaiian waters and exploring the, the, the sea bottom, and the reefs and the sand and the designs and whatnot. In some ways it struck me that I, I knew a lot of the contours of, of the ocean bottom and surface more than the land and, and how it, uh, how it evoked a sense of, of awe in me from, from, a young, from a young age, awe and wonder and reverence, as well as a tranquility and ease, a clarity. So this afternoon, I want to talk a little bit about two emotions we have and that we've all experienced um, probably all our lives outside of the context of, of our practice or any tradition, spiritual or religious, uh, as well as within it. And, and those two emotions are known as samvega, Samvega and Pasada. Samvega generally translated as a spiritual urgency and Pasada as a um, clarity or serene confidence. It's a quality you've heard us speak about also as one of the awakening factors. But like so many of these qualities, it stands alone. And as I, as I said, it stands outside, or it can stand outside of our spiritual practice time, um, the container of it and the years of practice within it. When I think of the ways that I've experienced this uh, samvega, this emotion of, of almost a kind of excitement and distress at the same time. Um, when, for example, our constructed illusions begin to fall apart about um, uh, how we, built the world in our minds, perhaps from a young age, and our family and education kind of constructs things to, to seem uh, positive and good. And if we do this, we'll get that. Um, but things happen at home in the family and outside or in school. Uh, and that illusion is sometimes broken that that um, uh, if you just do these things or believe in that or have this kind of understanding, it'll all be okay. But, but, but then something happens. In Hawaii, every growing up in the 
late 50s and 60s, every couple of years, or three years or so, we'd have, we'd have to evacuate because of a tsunami. Now, of all the tsunami warnings and evacuations, there, there are only, in my childhood and young adulthood, two, two serious ones that affected um, various areas on a couple of the islands. But it was enough to, to feel the fragility of life rather than just kind of moving through life and uh, this uh, beautiful place. It was pre-state Hawaii. And th so there are so many advantages to that, a small population, sense of community and safety, everyone knowing everybody, uh, everyone's kids belonging to everyone else as well. Uh, and so just that, that uh, freedom, uh, of course, did give an, an illusion that, that boy, maybe all of life might be like this and until something like that would, would break it. And an exterior uh, catastrophic situation like a tsunami, uh, you know, that, that's a big one, but we have little Tom Vega moments as well when something happens in our family and uh, what we believe in or trusted suddenly feels broken, something we didn't get, something that happened and, uh, and we feel shamed for it or something was denied. Um, it's, it's, it's an important value in our practice to recognize that quality of some Vega where we begin to feel the disillusionment uh, and the, um, the stresses from interaction that can create, begin to create a dispassion before we even know what that means. Like we just feel a little more distant from something. At first that might be like a defense where we um, sort of disconnect Later on, we might stay connected and just go through the process of feeling, you know, that's a painful aspect of life that um, we wish it wasn't there, but there it is. Um, uh, and then, you know, from that in initial knowing that it's not as we thought it was, life isn't what we thought it was, um, well, what can we do about it? You know, is there something that we can do about it? And that might be the urgency aspect that starts to guide us towards something. It might be music, uh, for me, it was the ocean, uh, waves, and um, the forests, and the explorations that were here in, in, in these islands, uh, in the land and in the sea. And for others, something else comparable it became like a solace, uh, uh, like a, a balance to the Samvega distress. And that balance is actually um, an aspect of the pasada, pasada, pasada being the tranquility uh, or that, that, that calm, serene, serenity and confidence that comes. Um, something that might help stir what motivates us um, directly connected to the Samvega is, you know, what, what early things do you think drew you toward a practice, toward um, any kind of psychological or philosophical or spiritual exploration? For some people, it's very immediate and direct like dukkha, uh, pain in the life, trauma in life and early life in the family or around us, uh, difficulty just e even surviving um, it, it for many people um, at various times. So families go through difficult times or as individuals, we go through difficult times. 
in, in early school life, for example, not adapting or feeling bullied or, you know, or charging through like everything will be all right, kind of entering the pipeline. If you do this, you do that, you get your degree, you know, someday will be greatly rewarded. Uh, and, you know, we find out that that's not the case. Those early dukkha experiences might be a series of little dukkhas that might be some major trauma that we still live with and still work with. For other people, it's a, it's a chitta, consciousness itself, the curiosity uh, of the mind that, that wants to explore, wants to understand how this mind and body work. And, and we might get interested in philosophical or psychological or physiological things. And that, that uh, interest, that intellect aspect of chitta consciousness uh, makes us curious about what we may eventually discover is the nature of uh, anicca, impermanence, and, and that there's nothing outside except for nibbana all conditioned phenomena are this, have this anicca nature to it. Uh, and the curiosity that might take us into science or physics or just life sciences, nature itself, in, in appreciating and attuning to the changeability of things. Uh, or the anatta nature, like asking questions, well, who am I? What am I? That kind of intellect might bring us it might be the, uh, the samvega urgency that leads us to practice. Um, for others, it's a kind of innate faith, confidence, trust, that there's this, you intuitively know that there's, there's, there's indeed something more than life and death. You know, the reverence, the awe, the beauty of things, um, that might be really striking, and 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 that in, that is an external stimulus for creating that, that faith, that calm, confident, heart, mind. But then to to further investigate that, to respect it as we would all of these qualities, to respect it, and and see what what is underlying that conviction, and conviction in what? What does it mean that there's more than life and death? So we follow that faith path and trail and wherever it takes us. And it takes some people to the heart of the Dhamma and it becomes their uh, kind of primary emotion for the entirety of their, of their practice. And others might be interested in like states of consciousness and want to explore um, that and that would take eventually if they started to experiment with some meditation they'd see that there is indeed many different states of consciousness the samadhi um, inspiration or motivation uh, it, and to see how one state can change to another so so quickly, and, and then there can be just faceted, uh, myriad qualities to, to the, the samadhi mind or heart. Uh, and out of that, maybe qualities like the Brahma Viharas, boundless, loving kindness, compassion, uh, mudita, empathetic joy, equanimity, all that can be then part of our exploration of samadhi and samadhi mental state might be some combination of all those things. Eventually we, we, we find ourselves that that spiritual urgency makes us take up the practice, makes us uh, find the conditions suitable for learning uh, for learning the practice that we can't just get it from books. They help for a while. And I got interested quite early on uh, in, in spiritual practices. 
once I, from the intensity of the 60s and early 70s uh, and applying that in my studies at school, um, I really um, immersed myself in, in literature, you know, classic literature as well as psychology and and uh, and spirituality, uh, and read and studied and you know, not to become a scholar, but just because of of a thirst, of a kind of a San Vega thirst, an urgency. I couldn't get enough. And after a while, I, I, I learned and appreciate and still do that that also can be a distraction. And I was reading some travel book called Big Sur and the Oranges of Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch, the, the painter from the Netherlands. Uh, it was a travel book by, uh, ironically, paradoxically, Henry Miller. Uh, and there was a line in there, uh, quite a bit in there, in some of the chapters on Krishnamurti. And at one point, there was a paragraph about Buddhism, and there was this, like a, almost an admonition, but very strongly put, if you're really serious and you really want to know, you have to take up meditation. As far as I know, Henry Miller never meditated in his life. <laughs> um, but he was very bright and very well read and, and knew literary people that crossed with many spiritual people. It's, he may have even met Krishnamurti, but since he spent a lot of time writing about him in that particular travel log. And, and, and so that did it. That was, that was a, a kind of Samvega moment. Something clicked and, um, and the, A couple of weeks after that, I, I met Ram Das, and uh, he was a guest at our home in Hawaii, in Honolulu, when he came to give talks. And he talked about this Tibetan center opening up in Colorado, the Naropa Institute. And, and he said that, you know, he said, you should come. And he was a few months away, which is where I came across Vipassana. And the particular tradition of Vipassana, there were a few being offered, but the one that struck me was the Burmese one. And it immediately hit a chord, a, a, a San Vega chord. And I knew that that's what I that was destined to do and wanted to do. And that I would probably go to Burma at some point. And so I did take it up. At the end of that summer, there was a the first retreat of, of this Burmese um, mindful Vipassana tradition, which I signed up for. It was 30 days. And so I jumped right in to a 30 day retreat um, and just devoured it in the sense of my spiritual thirst and hunger. You know, it's like I, I couldn't get enough. And so it really aroused a lot of the, the not only the Samvega, but the virya, the energy to do it and to sustain it. Um, left alone, the Samvega can become too intense, kind of overwhelming and quite intensely stressful. Uh, where we actually kind of feel traumatized, uh, really dismayed or in shock at, at discovering the meaninglessness of, of how life is presented to us in all in the systems that are presented to us uh, in our family system, in our education system, in our social and political uh, and our conventional religious systems, that they all, upon close, closer look, um, it's like swimming this morning, wearing 
um, mask and kind of free diving down and getting a real close up look at some of the fish and corals and seaweed and so forth. And that I hardly ever look at something like that unless someone is like pointing out a flower in their garden, you know, but so quiet under the sea. And the sea itself is like that emotion that balances some way the fasada and, and the, the calm and tranquility and clarity, confidence. It's cooling and, and it takes away the intensity of what may be the initial dismay of some vega, the, the overwhelm aspect of it. And, and also the feeling that we're ways in which we're complicit and complacent in, in buying in to the system, buying in to things as we're taught that if you, you follow the pipeline of doing this and getting the degree and having the family and living this way and getting this kind of job and promoting, and then you'll be really happy. <laughs> you know, and so, sometimes we live a long time before uh, we grow the disillusion and disenchantment, dispassion, and that all fades away. Sometimes before we even enter a spiritual path, as I'm sure with many of us, myself included, you know, that happens before we find the path. And, and then it's part of finding the path. And we feel really foolish, you know? So how is it that we kind of bought into it? I mean, Ram Dass and his psychedelics were the combination of Ram Dass himself, his humor, his intellect, and, and also the description of his psychedelic trips and, and those of us who did some experimentation, that was a way to kind of peel back the, the illusion, at least for a while, to get a peek of what's behind the wallpaper and what we think is to be true. So it's kind of to go through the dismay and, and then the feelings of having been um, foolish to buy into it, be complicit or complacent, distracted. So even after I started the path, if I studied or read too much, you know, that too uh, kept me from actually going through the necessary, uh, the dukkha aspect of in initially entering meditation practice where we feel just the raw rawness of our body that it essentially mostly our bodies are dukkha. You know, it, when we're really young and excited and have a lot of energy and practice and, and even have a lot of pleasant experience for some time, even some years, and it's all going well. And, you know, uh, we kind of feel a not necessarily healthy pride at over being able to sit through intense knee pain or the back on fire for really long periods of time and going through all of that uh, and, and until we come to a place of well so what you know kind of big deal it, that's dukkha too uh, buying into the, the pleasant and, and meditating for those great physical and mental experiences uh, even the clarity and the peace and the calm as well as the joy and the ecstasy and so forth. It, it's all a potential terrific distraction. And so the third aspect of, of, of a cluster of emotions that are part of some vega is doing something about it. What am I gonna do about it? The urgency to find something. That's what took me to Colorado and, and then to Asia. To India and to Burma when they when they opened up in 1980 to foreigners for longer than the one week. Earlier than that, I, I went for that one week in the mid 70s. I went to Burma for a week, uh, you know, al already knowing that it was this tradition, this the Mahasi tradition that we practice that 
that I felt the fire and the urgency for. Um, and going deep into Upper Burma to Mahasi's home village. And, and this is where I experienced the balance to Samwega and the Pasadi, the, the tranquility or the serene confidence. But as we pulled in in a big pickup truck with 15, 15 of us and a two-year-old baby, our daughter, Chandra, Mahasi was giving a talk as we drove into the, the courtyard of the monastery. And, you know, he knew that we were coming. He immediately stopped the talk. There were several hundred people in the, in the massive out, the open, open walled Dhamma hall, Sala, Outside, and um, it was it was a poignant a poignant time. First of all, to see these monastics uh, of the several hundred people, maybe a couple hundred of them were monastic nuns and monks, uh, and I hadn't really experienced them so closely, you know, so personally, just at a distance. There were some in India and here and there. But here, here they all were gathered where I felt, I felt them as the great protectors and transmitters for 2,600 years of the Dhamma. I felt what they gave, gave up. I, I had a, a first understanding of what it means, what renunciation is, the generosity of renunciation and the power of it, they, they, they were so balanced and they, they walked, all walked as if they were above the ground just with such gracious deportment and peace. It must have been how the Buddha felt uh, uh, as the Siddhartha, the young man, um, discovering for the first time, as you all know, uh, in a kind of real way, um, anyway, um, an old person, and then a, a, a sick person, and then a corpse. Each time, it, it, in whatever way it might have been, stepping out of the very fortified, protective distraction that his father and mother had created for him so that he wouldn't leave. So he'd always be satisfied, all the desires would, would be met physically, mentally. Uh, and, and so these were special mo moments when he left the confines of that protective distraction uh, and uh, mind turning to what was real when he went on these journeys aging, sickness, death. And then the, the fourth time he, he saw a mendicant, a renunciate. And that's where perhaps where the, where the other images are realities of aging and sickness and death uh, stirred the dismay and, and the disillusionment and the urgency of some Vega, seeing the mend mendicant was like that, that watery calm, tranquility, and, and, and uh, clarity, confidence, where then he prepared quite quickly to, to go off on the journey that led to Siddhartha becoming the Buddha. So entering the Mahasi's monastery in the 70s, um, and everyone, the villagers immediately came out to greet us, to essentially you know, hold us and take us to our, our rooms and prepare food and uh, uh, bathing facilities and bedding and just everything we needed to stay there for a few days uh, while we met 
met Mahasi for the first time. And, and that's, that's where I felt like I, in retrospect, later appreciated the combination and balance of these two emotions, that awakening urgency of some vega uh, to, to do something to, to awaken or sustain those awakening moments throughout one's practice. And, and, but the, the profound need for the balance of the emotions connected with a um, pasada, calm, tranquility, a, a connecting confidence and conviction, which is a, where I, I felt for the first time the manifestation of faith. I, ha I had a very early uh, hint of it living in Japan, but I was only six. And I, I only saw the gestures of reverence and respect, but now it was manifest in, in the nuns and monks as they moved about and, and the sea of people that would step aside uh, in their respect and reverence and care for the ordained Sangha, the nuns and monks, and the, the see to their needs, but also at the same time, a group of them seemed to our needs and feeling that their sincerity, feeling their, their own anchoredness, their devotion to the teachings and to the Dharma. I'd never seen something, but all there, all at once. The Dharma being um, transmitted by a reputed Arahant, fully enlightened being in Mahasi and his Sangha of nuns and monks there, their visceral saintliness, you know? Not that they were all perfect, but just they're doing it and they're, they're holding it. They're wearing the robe and they're following this ancient tradition. They embody uh, the fullness of the practice, including these two emotions I'm talking about, the, the ur spiritual urgency of some huega. And some translations just have it as emotion, as if it's like the first emotion. <laughs> They're thinking of our ancestors when they first started having the kind of intelligence that Homo sapiens has now. That's what I think of when, when I see it translated that way with just one word. Sanvega means emotion. And then to kind of fill it out, it does mean these other things, but the, the dismay or, or shock-like nature of realizing it's not as we thought it was and feeling our complacency, our complicity and uh, in following that and living that way. And then the urgency to, and, and will motivation to break out of it of the many motivations I mentioned, perhaps. Dukkha, our, our the intellect of chitta and faith and so forth. We've all experienced these, these feelings or clusters of feelings. We can practice them simply by recognizing them, noticing them, feeling them, uh, sensing them in the body if we can, and anchoring where we sense that whatever cluster we might, aspect of the cluster of emotions making up some vega. So it's just a discovery waiting for us what feels like that sort of um, opening up to um, the meaninglessness of life as it's presented to us, as most people follow. And, and what's the feeling there? Kind of a, you know, a sudden shudder, a trembling. And, and then how much are we a part of that? How much do we kind of follow along blindly? 
and, and then thirdly, and most importantly, can we feel that energy, that force that guides us towards doing something, making a difference? And, and with the Hatsada, same thing, the recognizing that the tranquility and the serene confidence that allows for and completes and holds in balance of the intensity of the samvega and, and ways in which we recognize the feelings and cluster of feelings around the pasadi, pasada. Uh, where in the body are they? The, just that recognition and the feeling, sensing, knowing them itself develops them. There are other ways to develop them, which we'll talk about in the future. So I'm going to stop there and maybe close with um, um, these Theravada remembrances, five Theravada remembrances that help overcome our intoxication with, with youth, with health, with life, uh, with things dear and appealing to us, as well as to uh, our, our unskillful behaviors, the errors, mistakes that we make in action. The, the five remembrances are, I am subject to aging, have not beyond, gone beyond aging. This is the first fact that one should reflect on often, whether one is a woman or a man, lay or ordained. Second, I am subject to illness, have not gone beyond illness. And then the same re refrain, this is the second fact that one should reflect on. Thirdly, I am subject to death, have not gone beyond death. I will grow different, separate from all that is dear and appealing to me. And fifth, I am the owner of my actions, heir to my actions, born of my actions, related through my actions, and have my actions as my arbitrator. Whatever I do, for good or for harm, to that will I fall heir. This is the fifth fact that one should reflect on often, whether one is a woman, a man, lay, or ordained. Samwega Asada. Now you might have uh, some questions for Jesse or myself regarding the instructions or the talk, your sitting practice experience. Maybe even in today's practice, you experience some of these clusters of emotion with some way to, or Asada.
Are we full? Full of Dhamma? Everyone's Quinn. feeling the Pasada calm. <laughs> ah, Quinn. Peace. Quinn does have a question. Here we go. Uh, Steve, it was very powerful. Uh, now uh, I understand why uh, in my younger days, uh, when I had a busy life with my career and my family obligations, all of a sudden I felt I had to go on a retreat. There was no question about it. I just like let go of everything and had to go for seven days or a month or whatever. Now I understand what that means, that spiritual urgency. urgency. So my question is, if someone encounter a traumatic experience or a disillusion about life, could she or he turn to addiction instead of like spiritual practice? Absolutely. That that would be a, that would be an easy refuge for them, not a healthy one that it would be a, a distraction from the intensity of the trauma. And, and if, particularly if they didn't have that, that other cluster of emotions, the pasada, the, the calm, the clarity, the confidence, the tranquility, that if, people, if someone has that, uh, if that is up strong in the consciousness, uh, it's less likely they go towards the distraction of addiction or in general to distractions. But yes, they still can go, they would, and particularly in, in the list of motivations I mentioned, you know, early dukkha experiences and so forth all kinds of trauma that we can experience in early life and, or even having the spiritual urgency, but no outlet for it. And so if someone goes very inward, I, I would see that I, addictions would be tantalizing. Yeah, I, I imagine that would give uh, somebody a temporary relief or some sense of peace. Um, I, I missed the first part. Would addiction so, give yes. you that? You know, Would addiction, yeah, right? And, and so I'm just wondering what make a person go one way or the other? I have, I have no idea. I mean, my first impulse is just, it's our sort of karmic conditions that influence our intentions. Therefore, intentions in the sense of choices. What are we inclined toward? If the people aren't inclined at all toward ad addictive behaviors, some are inclined toward, you know, extreme sports, for example, or surfing really big waves or diving to really deep depths and that kind of thing. But, but they can be seen as ways to get away from overwhelming trauma. Right. So a lot is karma in there. Yeah. It, it, it is. And I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe Jesse would have a, a view on it. I don't know how important or necessary it is to understand why the choice is made toward addiction or toward some other kind of distraction, as much as trying to understand the person that's experiencing that pull to addiction or that's in the addiction. Understanding and connecting and compassion there would, would be really, in my view, more useful than trying to figure out why it happened in the first place. because I just shuddered thinking that I could have gone the other way into addiction instead of into spiritual practice. Yes, that's right. M many of us could have. Yeah. 
mean, it, it is understood at this point, you know, that the primary, like the fundamental predictor of of lifelong addiction, substance abuse is childhood trauma. So like those are, those very much go hand in hand. And, and of course, there are childhood traumas that are common to many. And then there's, you know, the, the difference between, you know, as Steve was describing, it's like the, the sense of solidity, of trustworthiness, of family, of predictability that gets maybe ruptured or threatened or, un, you know, um, the, the, the illusion of it gets kind of, you know, uh, pulled at some point. But many people grow up without any basic sense of stability or structure or safety or expectation that things will work out if you do anything. And so, of course, those are, there isn't um, the sort of, the, the spiritual footing to have fallen from, right? Or the spiritual sort of groundedness and sense of ease, even in conditioned reality to then feel like, oh, you have a taste for ease, a taste for quietude, a taste for equanimity, um, rather than just fear or dread or whatever, you know, sort of conditions might be. And so, you know, then you do start to see the ways that these are, you know, generationally passed down and, um, how like very difficult it is to to choose even the experience of being able to see a group of monks and nuns and the beauty of that right how rare that is in this world to be able to have that kind of inspiration uh what are the chances of coming into contact with people who are inspiring in that way right where we might have a sense of like oh this is a a being that feels like safe to be around and so you know there, there are all kinds of conditions that that are less likely to happen due to social position. And so um, the, and on the other hand, so much of what I have seen is people who become, you know, heavy substance users, really, you know, hard addicts for many years, often do share something very deep with most yogis i know people who are drawn to the spiritual path right they're very they're often very sensitive people and uh you know very fragile and very gentle really you know at heart and have never you know haven't had the opportunities and kind of conditions or or the mysteries of kama and how one might be inclined towards one thing or another that like steve is saying will never you know you can't you can't ever fully tease out, but that, um, that, that it's a hard turn to go from knowing that something is going to provide you some basic pleasure in the moment. That's going to be such a relief and what it takes to go from the dependency on that assuredness to facing the truth of total undependability of all conditioned phenomena is like that's a pretty hard turn and so that that um and people do it plenty do you know uh plenty in our sangha and so um it's a it's powerful you know i do think that there is something um deeply moving you know when when people are able to make that turn and realize and that and that it, that that there is something basic that we all do share in that of like that it, it is harder to face whatever reality or is is apparent right now and it's disintegrating nature <laughs> then to try to stabilize around whether it's drugs or just thought or fantasy or whatever you know i mean i think that the the, the the deeper addiction that we all have to trying to cling to this pleasure or run from pain um is you know on, on another fundamental human level, probably actually not very different from one person to the next, no matter what conditions we kind of grew up in, you know? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, Harry. Okay. Yeah. Um, Going beyond addiction and going beyond traumas being the gateway, that cheetah aspect that Steve talked about, inquiry, 
motivated and does motivate a lot of people to turn to drugs, to to all kinds of, yeah, surfing, extreme sports, everything to try and have some sense of transcendence. I, Jung, uh, Jung talked about the Puer Eternus being the archetype of the priest and the alcoholic or the, they, they, they share so much. I mean, you know, it, it, it's not called spirits for no, for an accidental reason. And there is something there, but it's so limited and so, so limited that it, it, it doesn't do the trick. But, you know, if you look back at the 60s and 70s, the gateway to, to almost everything we're talking about now in the West, you know, had its roots in that kind of yearning, which came through drugs and sometimes stopped there, unfortunately. But um, yeah, or like, I, I like yeah. talking to people that have had those kinds of experiences because I feel like uh, there's a thing in the Bible that Christ says, I'd rather you be hot or cold than lukewarm or I vomit you out of my mouth. It's like that. Uh, these are hot people a lot of times. They are searchers. Uh, it's easier to connect there than to connect with someone who is um, just not dead, but dead. Yeah, especially when there's a commitment to it. I mean, I think kind of partly also what Steve is saying is like some folks who it may not be our path, but it but if people are, you know, or some I don't want to be too light about it. But that sense of uh one of these rock stars he said, you know, rehab is for quitters. Yeah. It's like there there there's something about like or I'll, let's just say the the Olympics, right? It's like th there is a compulsion there of like the, a lot of these incredible athletes that is like not necessarily the, what we're drawn to or what I'm drawn to in terms of being, but I can appreciate like something about it. It's amazing, you know, and, and I don't have a sense that everyone needs to be doing this practice or everyone is aiming towards liberation in this way, you know, that people are exploring, like kind of like Steve was saying, people are exploring all kinds of things in terms of consciousness, in terms of their bodies, in terms of life. And um, I don't think it's, it's our place to judge them all in all. I think there is an understanding that some are destructive. Some can be very destructive to people's lives or to families or, you know, people around them and that that's real and, and that that would be something worth avoiding or, or that create more suffering you know in, in in life and that's really hard yeah they, they uh, i forget who said it i don't know if it's ramdas or one of the or the inventor or discoverer of lsd or one of those big heavyweights i asked him do you do it anymore and he said no he says once i've gone through the door i don't have to go through again and i think what happens with a lot of uh the drug oriented uh, searching for transcendence is it becomes that kind of repetitious thing that goes to a dead end and doesn't open up the way the experience of the Dhamma and its, and its fullest sense can open up. What, what helped me um, in my initial experimentation with psychedelics in the late 60s was reading something that I think it was Alan Watts, or one of those heavyweights, as you put it, who said, when you get the message, you hang up the phone. That was really all it took. If there's no one else, there's one more. It's one more. Yeah. I, okay. Neem, oh, this is, I think it's Neem Karoli Baba uh, with, with uh, Ram Dass's. Yeah. Guru. Yeah. Ram Dass's guru or something about, he talked to him about 
LSD and he says, what are these funny, something like this, what are these funny vitamins that you take? He says, oh, give me some. You've heard this story. And he takes a handful of the stuff he's just ingested. He says, okay. You know, it was like, I'm there. I, I don't, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nothing happened. And he yeah. said in, in ancient day, the rishis took some, uh, you know, pharmaceutical that did something like that, that helped them on their spiritual path. Uh, Upandita once said that too, about in, in Burma, that there were, there were sadhus or rishis in ancient, di in ancient days who took some kind of pharmaceutical as a spiritual aid, you know, with the intention not, not to use it as a habit. Um, Oliver just wrote in here into the chat about what about the addiction to emotions like anger? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's it, on a, on a, on a fundamental level, it's no different, you know, of course there's, you know, social dynamics that can, you know, make the outcomes sort of different or more or less acceptable in different containers or situations, but yeah, absolutely. The addiction to identity ultimately and, and our, our bodies, our, our minds, ourselves, who we are, who, you know, our fantasy of who we want to be. And, and for sure our, our, the whole range of our emotional st states and mind states, yeah. Interesting discussion today. Mm -hmm. Poignant. Oh, you Tim. Your hand up, Tim. Yeah, there we go, Tim. Let's see. Can you unmute there? There we go. Um, Great. This is just an observation, but Steve, what I heard you say, among other things, was that Ramdas was really pivotal in helping you you know move deep more deeply into this and for me uh, what this is bringing up is I have, I'm having a memory when I was you know actually quite young I was reading DT Suzuki and was absolutely in a cognitive intellectual sense drawn to the Dharma and then um, a friend of mine said that Stephen Levine was giving a talk and that was the first time I ever had contact with an actual embodied Westerner who was experientially living this, who was radiating it out. And I remember I was working in a hospital in another state at the time, and I went back after the talk and I just felt drunk. Something was so stirred up in me and I felt so much joy. But I think where I'm going with this is that I think it was the contact with someone who was actually doing it, a human being who apparently was walking this path. And he, he was never a teacher of mine, but that was what really, really encouraged me to continue experientially sitting. Wow, there are actual Western people who talk my language and have similar experiences to me. Um, and it's doable. And that, that was the doorway. And then, you know, a lot of other things unfolded after that. I, I guess what I'm trying to say in essence is, at least for me, it's always the personal contact with someone which brings, you know, kind of opens that door for me. I, I agree. I think it's very relational. Yes, yeah. And, and one, I mean, what you described as, as drunk to me, and then you said you felt this flush of joy. It, it's as if the, the talk you, you listened to evoked the, that samvega, yeah. you know, 
yeah. urgency and and, and the uh, the calm abiding the joy the clarity well it, it, it's funny steve because it was it was like a rush of emotion that i'd never had before yes. and i almost felt when i say drunk there was this incredible sense of expansion and joy yeah. and i was just flooded with something and I kind of knew what it was, you know, this is a result of this contact with Stephen Levine. But anyway, yeah, yeah, it just, something opened up inside of me as a result of that right. experience. Yeah. <clears throat> also, what we call PT. Yeah, PT yeah, enjoy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ec ecstatic sensations and feelings and consciousness <clears throat> states, yeah. Yeah. Well, good. It's nice to honor and, and feel gratitude for all the forces that came together in our journey, you know, to re respect that and regard that. It's, it's still there, it's still alive. And, and that kind of reflection can continue cultivating uh, the necessary and helpful qualities here and now. So thanks, Tim. Well, maybe that is a good note to end on. What was it, Steve? And Hank, when the message is uh, received, you can hang up. You get the message, you hang up the phone. <laughs> you can log off Zoom. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Really wonderful to see you all. Good to be here with you. Until later. Aloha. <laughs>